Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Kitchen Table Classroom. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us this evening. I know that schedules are really busy this week with Halloween coming up and all the excitement around that. So um, thanks so much for joining um, for joining us. My name is Kate Schutz. I'm with the Calgary Public Library. And I'm here tonight with my colleague, uh, Emily from the Edmonton Public Library. I'd like to start off tonight by acknowledging this land that our schools and our libraries and our homes reside on. And although we're meeting virtually, uh, we can still come together and think about this beautiful place that we live here in Treaty 7 in Calgary and Treaty 6 in Edmonton. Um, at Calgary Public Library, our Indigenous Services team have developed a children's land acknowledgement that we use in school programs and in virtual story times and in all of our children's programming. And I'd like to share that with you tonight. Um, if you'd like to use it in your own home, or I know many educators join us for these kitchen table classroom sessions, uh, you might like to use it in your classroom as well. We do have a video on our YouTube channel of, uh, of this land acknowledgement. So uh, if you need a refresher, you can go there. So let's begin on Treaty 7. So we have seven fingers. Today we acknowledge our Treaty 7 friends, and this is the uh, sign language for friends, where the Blackfoot meet on elbows bend. Soon came the Tsutina from the beaver clan. This is your beaver tail. The Ahe Nakoda from the mountain lands. Nice big mountain there. Last but not least, the Métis people of region three, we are all treaty people here in Calgary. Thanks so much. Lovely, thank you. As Kate said, my name is Emily. I'm a community librarian with the Edmonton Public Library. Uh, we would like to acknowledge Edmonton is located within Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. We acknowledge this land as the traditional territories of many First Nations, such as the Naheo, Denisuline, Nakota Sioux, Anishinaabe and Nitsitipi. Many First Nations, Métis and Inuit footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I'm gonna be introducing actually a colleague of mine, Shannon. Shannon has been a community librarian at Edmonton Public Library for 11 years. She has enjoyed working at multiple branches and serving on a variety of system-wide teams, most recently the school age services team. With two kids in elementary school, the topic of digital parenting has become much more personal over the past few years and is a favorite topic of discussion for Shannon, both at work and at home. She is excited to share with you what she's learned, but more importantly, to encourage you to have regular digital citizenship discussions with your own friends and family. Thanks so much for joining us, Shannon. I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Hi. And thank you so much for sharing your evening with me. It's really great to see so many parents and caregivers and educators wanting to support our kids as they navigate an increasingly complex world that's nothing like the one that we grew up in. So I'd like to start with a bit of a personal spooky story for Halloween about when I first realized that being a parent in the digital age is about more than limiting my kids' screen time. Um, about Maybe three years ago, my daughter came home from grade one and with a very strange sense of urgency, she went straight down to the basement. I was cleaning out the lunch bags in the kitchen and it was very quiet for a while until I heard a piercing scream followed by hysterical crying. I thought the kids were fighting and someone was injured, but it turned out that my six-year-old daughter had opened the computer, typed scary Momo, into Google and was faced with a gruesome image of a horror character, which she promptly showed to her little brother. A friend at school told her to do this. So at the time, I didn't even know that she could type, let alone do a Google search. I immediately put a password on the computer. We had a big talk about the internet and the whole experience was a big wake up call for me. And years later, the haunting image of scary Momo still burned in our minds. So I'm, sur I'm sure that some of you have had similar experiences and it can be a really scary time to be a parent, whether you've got a kindergartner addicted to Roblox or a teen facing bullying through social media. 
But the main message that we want to share with you tonight is even if you can't control what's out there in your kids' worlds, either online or offline, we can prepare ourselves and prepare our kids to take control of their own digital citizenship. We can make mistakes and learn from them, talk about them and keep going. So tonight we'll discuss what digital citizenship is. We'll share some stories and learn about some specific online resources you can get to through both Edmonton Public Library and Calgary Public Library. And these resources should keep you communicating with your kids about digital citizenship in an open and positive way. I'm gonna try really hard to keep an eye on the clock to make sure we save lots of time for questions and stories at the end. So what does it mean to be a digital citizen? First, we need to know what is digital citizenship? And as we know, this week is National Media Literacy Week and Media Smarts is highlighting the five aspects of digital media awareness that they promote, which are use, understand, engage, access, and verify. You can find more on their uh, website, which we'll show a little bit later. But basically, digital citizenship refers to the responsible use of technology by anyone who uses computers, the internet, and digital devices to engage with society on any level. So that's you, that's me, that's everybody. And the way you are as a citizen should reflect the way, the, like the way you are as a citizen online reflects how you are as a citizen offline. So parents, caregivers, and community members, we all want kids to be good citizens. And it's important that we understand how we use digital technology rubs off on our kids. Um, so I like to take a moment um, to ask ourselves a few questions and you can think, read these and ask them in your head or jot down some notes. Um, but first think about how do you use technology in your everyday life? And this can be for work, for pleasure. Um, so think about that. And then how do your kids use technology? Maybe write down a couple of things or just put them in your mind. Because there's, lot, there's lots. But what we really need to think about is do you have any concerns first about your own technology use? And do you have any concerns about how your kids and their peers use technology? Um, this is a project with the Alberta Teachers Association, the ATA, partnering with Harvard Medical School and School of Public Health, as well as the University of Alberta. And this is a recent study that looked at technology use um, and its learning and health impacts on kindergarten to grade 12 students. So if you'd like to view the full infographic summary, this will be on one of the lists that we share afterwards. But some of the key findings show many positive elements for kids in the digital world. So there are ways that youth use technology to stay connected. For example, 85% of parents say that technology makes it easier to stay in touch with friends and family. But the concerns identified, 39% of parents are concerned about children's exposure to digital content when they're not with them. And that goes back to our thinking about how we can't control what our kids' peers have on their phones at school. We can't control um, most of this world. But our kids need us to give them the confidence to be able to speak up for themselves when something makes them uncomfortable and to talk about it afterwards. So it's really important to help youth understand what it means to be safe online because as much as we may want to be with them all the time, it's important um, to recognize that we can't be with our kids every time they use a digital device. Um, another thing that parents noted in this study was about technology use away from the home and how that can impact physical activity, anxiety, and emotional health. And um, noting that it's really important to balance time online and offline. So part of the study also asked parents what their questions are um, and thinking about, there's lots of questions around uh, parenting in the digital age. So if you have questions, you're not alone. And this study kind of highlights some of the interesting ones. But um, on the top of my mind, since starting online schooling, um, my kids were on the computer for a large amount of time every day, often unsupervised. 
And they started playing games and communicating directly with people in the games who pressured them to keep coming back to the games. And I didn't know who these people were and it, it was kind of creepy for me, but seemed perfectly normal for the kids. So I knew that we had to talk about it. And this was a concern, um, kind of going back to that question of concerns about your own technology use. I talk to strangers online all the time, so, um, but when my kids do it, it's, it is a bit different. So looking at that and thinking about that is, is really important to talk. And you may wonder where to start. So we looked at how there are benefits and concerns with living in a digital environment. But luckily there are tons of resources to help guide us through this journey. Um, the International Society for Technology and Education or ISTE has some really great uh, resources. But um, if, you were, if you didn't know about this and you just Googled digital citizenship and youth, you get over 19 million websites. So it's super hard to know where to start. But we like it, the ISTE standards in Edmonton, both um, Edmonton Public School Division has formally adopted these and EPL likes the approach that it takes because it's emphasizing the positive. Um, one of my favorite messages from ISTE is that you don't have to have all the right words or to know all the answers. You just have to start talking. You have to have the conversation because that's what matters and our kids are listening. So talking about your own experiences and your own digital decisions, where things have gone wrong, where things have gone right, and just constantly sharing that and talking about it is really important. So ISTE loves to talk about practicing the positive. So I thought it would be useful to share a really brief video clip of the CEO of ISTE talking about making digital citizenship positive. So I'm just gonna put up this video. And far too often, digital citizenship is taught in a negative way. Here's the list of things not to do online. And while I deeply appreciate the intent behind all the anti cyberbullying campaigns, we don't teach other things as anti in our schools, right? I mean, we don't have like an anti illiteracy campaign, we teach people to love to read. <laughs> digital citizenship shouldn't be a list of don'ts, but a list of do's. La Cañada School District in California decided instead of teaching anti-cyberbullying, they were going to start teaching their kids what it meant to be good cyber friends, which includes watching out for people who aren't being treated respectfully online. In addition to being more compelling, by the way, keeping it positive is actually something you can practice. You can't, you can't practice not doing something. The other thing we need to evolve is our thinking around recognizing that the skills required to thrive as a digital citizen go far beyond just online safety. It includes being respectful of people with differing viewpoints from our own, recognizing fact from fiction online, using technology to engage in civil action, knowing how to have the right balance of activities online and offline, and of course, knowing how to be safe and also create safe spaces for others. Okay, so we're talking about being inclusive and informed these five key areas um, that he talks about can be linked to anything that you can practice and that we can keep doing. So when when ISTE talks about being inclusive, they're talking about being creating a space to hear other points of view. So when you're looking at information online, you're looking at different points of view, not just your own. You're not using an um, well, sometimes things are set up to give you information that you're going to want, but this is a way of looking for different kinds of information. Being informed is evaluating the accuracy of information online. Engage to use technology and digital channels for civic engagement to make your community a better place. And of course, being balanced is when we talk about spending um, time offline, but also time online and making sure that those activities are balanced. Being alert often comes up um, in a negative way and, and there's so many things to be afraid of online. So to reframe that as something positive, um, rather than being afraid or worried, we can be alert. Um, so there's a really nice little poster on the ISTE website, which you can print off and put on your fridge to remind you, your family and yourself and your kids um, what each of these competencies is. 
And you can also go to the Dig Sit Commit website and see a short video clip for each of these five competencies. So as we know, we talked about being alert and how kids in the 21st century are growing up with technology and social media that they're constantly connected. And often kids are recording themselves and their lives online to seek validation. Um, there's a lot of talk in the news about how likes can affect mental health. And so there are, there are so many things to be alert to. And by talking about it, we can be alert to it in a positive way. So here's just a few things that are of regular concern for parents. One that really sticks out for me is that permanency of social media posts and that there is no delete button on the internet. Um, and that's something my own kids have struggled with because uh, they have friends who have phones, who take pictures of them, who share them on Snapchat. And I try to remind them that if you allow this to happen, um, you don't know where this could end up. And this is always going to be there. So to be alert to that and to, in a positive way, say, my body's nobody's body but mine. And my that counts for um, your digital um, reputation and being uh, present online. And so yes, you, you may see this list that there is a lot of things to be alert to, but we must shift our mindset from being alert to them in a fear-based way to practicing being alert to them in a way that is positive and that keeps kids talking. So, oh, and identity theft, that's a, that's a hard one. But a lot of these things you're probably really familiar with and um, but maybe need more information about them. So that's where we kind of talk about setting up a great place to start with a plan. And this uh, Media Smarts, it's Canada's Centre for Digital and Media Literacy, has some really great uh, starting points for this. Um, their family tip sheet, which I actually printed off, it's a, a very simple and short little guide that tells you exactly some of the ideas for things that you should put on your list, but maybe you don't, you reevaluate that. So they've shown that um, having household rules about internet use, those families are and kids are less likely to post contact information or visit gambling sites, seek out pornography, talk to strangers online. Um, by being positive and having a plan, they're then safer. And then we next have the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. There's a little set of check boxes that you can click through on their website that show all the things that you might be doing online. And then it will spit out a tip sheet for you about things to be aware of or how to be careful with those different activities. So some other tips are obviously, like we talked about at the beginning, is to lead by example. Um, Think about what you personally are gaining by your technology use and how to model treating people online the same way you would treat them in person to create safe environments for everyone. Another good example is to not post pictures of your kids without asking them first if it's okay or to um, talk to your friends about what you're sharing on social media. Then, of course, setting expectations, that's where we talk about having the plan and the, what um, Media Smarts calls that family online rules sheet. Being open and keeping talking is so important. So maybe even every day saying to your kids, what happened on social media today? Or even just to show an interest and to make sure they know that you're a, an open ear when something goes well or maybe when something doesn't go so well. And this keeping talking is a, a proactive rather than reactive approach, which is always really helpful. And joining in is actually fun, which I've discovered because I have a, a seven year old who loves Minecraft and we always struggle with the time, like when it's time to turn off the computer. So um, by joining in and by me asking him, what are you building? Um, why don't you close it up and we'll talk about it. And then trying it out and bringing home books from the library about Minecraft. That's led to a much more positive um, relationship between something that I originally resented, which is all the screen time in the Minecraft, to something I'm now supportive of and learning about the benefits of. And this actually came from a library customer I was talking to who was very resentful of her daughter spending so much time on her phone, um, but then finally got up the courage to ask her, hey, what are you doing on there? 
in a positive and open way. And her daughter explained that she's really into recipes and she wants to learn how to cook. So they, they started browsing some of the same Instagrams and um, cooking together. And it turned out to be something really positive. So joining in is essential. And then of course, asking for help. And this is where you maybe you're gonna ask um, for help from your peers, your co-parents, your family, um, your friends, parents, teachers, your big community, and even um, obviously not even the library. So uh, both Edmonton Public Library and Calgary Public Library um, have a lot of resources to connect you to more digital citizenship support. So I'm going to show a few of these little things and then we can uh, browse through them and have some uh, specifics that seem more interesting depending on what ages your kids are or what you're interested to know. So if you're on the Calgary Public Library site, um, you can go to the search box and type digital citizenship and then choose list from the drop down instead of a keyword or a title. And this is going to show both from Calgary Public Library and Edmonton Public Library and many different library systems around the world share their resource lists, their book lists, and all of this material through our uh, shared catalog software. So if you do this basic list search, you'll see we have lists of resources for parents, uh, picture books to promote digital citizenship, internet safety resources for kids and teens, and for parents and for educators. So same thing if you're on the EPL site, you type in digital citizenship, click on list, and this will take you uh, to those four things that I just showed you. And this is called, um, this is a list of picture books. So a lot of these picture books really seek to show younger children like preschool, kindergarten, grade one, what it means to be balanced. That's one of the five core competencies and how to prioritize my time and activities online and offline. So some of these titles are really cute and they're um, kind of all following the same theme of uh, a character who's really into their, their device. They're doing such great stuff on there, but then they get out into the world and have some fun in nature just to spark discussions about what balance means, why computers and digital technology are awesome, um, but then how to balance that with time offline in a meaningful way. So using a story is a really great kind of way to talk about this in a positive way. And again, when you do that list search, you'll see um, resources. Uh, we've got it divided up for teens. This one I've indicated kind of um, reaches out to that competency of I'm inclusive. Talk, um, some of these are fiction books that talk about um, creating safe online spaces and being uh, engaging with peers online in a respectful and empathetic way. So we've talked about um, those resources through lists, but mo a lot of that is like uh, internal library stuff, but both of our libraries have resources to reach out to media literacy um, directly through our library website. So on Calgary Public Library, you can become an info investigator by taking a, a fun quiz that teaches and assesses media literacy skills. Um, this I did myself, it was quite fun and it's designed for grades four to six. But then there's a list of uh, other websites that we're going to talk about right away that you can directly link to through the uh, media literacy page on Calgary Public Library. And this you get to by using the main menu, going to connect and students, and then we'll show that actually at the end. Um, but the game here is really fun. And it's a fun, positive way to do something with your child to think about that I'm informed competency when we're talking about those, those five key areas. Um, and then if you have younger kids, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, which we just briefly mentioned before, has a whole huge list of activity sheets. And there, there's like connect the dots, word searches, coloring sheets, all talking about online safety and how to make smart, um, friendly, kind choices online. So this privacy snakes and ladders, um, you get to go up the ladder when you do kind things. Um, or if you tell a parent if someone is um, 
bullying you online or someone says something mean online and then you go down if you share your password or um, share personal information online. So these are printable and, and pretty fun. This is uh, addressing the I'm alert element. So for tweens and teens, the social smarts graphic novel is very popular and fun. And it's like a printed graphic novel about um, two teens and their experiences in high school um, with practical tips to stay safe and um, lots of additional resources, but it also has a discussion guide for adults. And you can print this off and um, color it yourself or sit down with your teenager and color the graphic novel together while talking about the characters and the choices they make and uh, how to make good choices to stay safe, but also to um, respect each other and to be kind. So we talk about um, this Google search for digital citizenship and youth and you get 19 million hits. Where do you start? So we talked about ISTE is a really great resource and um, a place that kind of collaborate or collects everything all together within those five key competencies is called Dig Sit Commit. That was mentioned at the end of that video that we just watched at the beginning. So Media Smarts, Common Sense Media, the Google Be Internet Awesome, Need Help Now and Don't Get Sextorted are all um, digital uh, citizenship, internet safety resources that we recommend looking at. So to go into a little bit more detail, Media Smarts is what kind of got us all started on this with um, their this week of Media Literacy Week here. And they will have a little checkbox on the side of the um, homepage where you can look at all these different topics. It goes on and down if you click more. And it will give you either a tip sheet, a game, a video, or a guide. And they have uh, tip sheets that are really helpful about um, are you web aware, a checklist for parents. So it's a really great, easy place to start if you're just kind of thinking about some of the things that you need to do um, to promote more positive digital citizenship in your house. Like, are you involved in your kids' online activities? Do you know what they're doing and who they're talking to when they're on the internet? So you, you look at this, uh, in a completely honest way and see where you check yes, where you check no, and where maybe you can talk to your family about things that you'd like to do differently or get some feedback. And then this digital citizenship guide for parents is extremely thorough. Um, it's prepared by the government of Canada and includes lots of specific uh, concrete talking points for different topics around digital citizenship. And uh, Common Sense Media is like super fun around this time of year as well because they have a uh, list of recommendations for Halloween movies. I have a, a child who's very terrified of anything even a little bit scary. So I have to be very careful with this. And I always go to Common Sense Media to see what the violence, what the scary elements are for movies that they're going to watch. But it also um, goes into apps, it goes into um, music, uh, books even. So when you're thinking about the stuff or trying to make recommendations for your kids, um, you can always turn to Common Sense Media. Uh, my son came home from school and asked if he could watch Squid Game because all the kids play Squid Game at recess and they play Red Light, Green Light. And then, you know, he went into all of this and I, he said like, check common sense media. I was like, I don't, I don't need to check common sense media, but thank you for saying that. So it, it's remarkable what other kids are, are watching and the media that they're consuming. And then um, everyone is so different. So when your child wants to do what everyone else is doing, it's helpful to read the reviews and to see what the specific elements are in that media. Um, I really like Google Be Internet Awesome. It seems to be quite popular to like have five key elements of digital citizenship. So the ISTE ones are amazing. Um, Google's, they're all, they're very similar, just different kind of wording. So to be internet awesome with Google, you have to be smart, alert, strong, kind, and brave. And it does align with ISTE. Um, 
I miss the Google the Internet Awesome site has, um, well, because Google runs YouTube, they have some really specific and helpful ways to monitor uh, the settings on YouTube and how to make sure that um, you've uh, kind of set up things that are going to get your child things that they want to see, things that are helpful, rather than because YouTube is a huge a beast of its own. And so there's a really helpful guide on here about YouTube. There's also a really fun game called um, Interland, where the little character goes through each of these five areas of being internet awesome with questions and trivia and lessons that follow that are brief, but really fun and really easy to connect with. So be internet awesome. The family guide you can go through with your family and um, it covers all of these things in a, in a really positive way. So, um, right. So then the last couple uh, resources that we will talk about here, like need help now is when a child or a teen or a parent needs help to remove a sexual picture from the internet. And like we said, there is no delete button on the internet. So there are, um, resources that you can get direct help with and information on this site. There's also a presentation you can download and go through if you want to find uh, proactive ways to talk to your child or if you're an educator and you want to use a presentation that's for free on here. And don'tgetsextorted.ca is also very useful and interesting and um, sextortion is a kind of blackmail when someone threatens to send an image or a video of you to other people if you don't pay them or provide more sexual content. Unfortunately, this has been on the rise lately, um, especially with younger and younger victims and perpetrators. So there was a recent, not that recent anymore, but this a couple of years ago, this campaign was aiming to help victims who are reluctant to reach out for help. And it uses a lighter tone for a heavy topic. So there's a short video of this teacher um, talking about what to do. And the main message is that if someone asks you to send naked pictures of them, don't do it. Send a naked mole rat instead. And um, it, it has, there's this site I like because it has a lot of balance between um, taking a positive approach to preventing something that can be devastating and criminal and very um, horrendous. So it's a great place just to check out to kind of prepare yourself. And I, like I have, um, I know people who had this situation happen with their kids and it, it's horrifying. Like it doesn't, you think it maybe won't happen, but it can happen and knowing what to do and how to pre be prepared and also having all those conversations ahead of time so that your family and your, your children um, feel safe to come to you. So these resources, um, they're all connected through, as I mentioned, digsitcommit.org and the inclusive, informed, engaged, balanced and alert. And again, um, kind of connected in a positive way. If you go to this site, this is uh, partnering with ISTE, partnering with the Google the Internet Awesome and lots of other organizations that are um, sharing the same mission of um, making life online a positive experience for kids and their families. So even just by looking at one or two of these, if you take that time after the presentation today or within the next week, you've already made like a really great, um, a great start by coming to this presentation and your kids are in a good place, having parents and caregivers and teachers and community members who are involved and looking out to promote this kind of positive um, digital citizenship. So looking again at these five core competencies, of digital citizenship. Um, I have a question for, for you, the, the audience and the participants. And so thinking of those five competencies, what's one thing you can do this week to promote positive digital citizenship in your family? Maybe the one thing is, is reading through one of these guides or filling out a Media Smarts uh, questionnaire about your current um, web awareness. So think about this and 
as you're thinking about it, thinking about the one thing you can do this week, getting pretty specific and immediate, um, you can share that in the chat. And then we're going to answer a few questions, but I also would like to uh, take some time after we've answered a few questions to share my screen again to go through some of these wild web resources in more detail. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, those are amazing resources. I'm looking forward to digging in. Some of them I've seen before, some of them are new to me. So I'm really excited to get into that more. And I, I so related with your story right at the top. I know the scary Momo thing was the thing that happened to my nephew and, it, uh -huh. you know, went on for a while. It took a while to get over that. I'm sure lots of people have their own stories. So. Nobody here, don't do it. Don't <laughs> no, do it's it. not worth it. <laughs> not today. Um, it does look like, oh yeah, we have somebody, Twyla, who's going to talk to uh, their child about the usage. Uh, that they and their partner do daily about how addictive it can be and that we also as parents need to set ourselves limits not just our child yeah I think that's that's a big one for me in the poll that was the thing I was concerned about with my own technology use was you know how much am I on my phone um, or my tablet in front of my child did you want to speak to that a little bit more Shannon that sort of modeling well, I think that balance looks different in every family and my kids have asked like daddy's on his phone all the time and he works in social media marketing and he's all he's literally always on his phone and I don't have social media I'm only on my phone if someone texts me or, or calls me and so my kids see both ends of the spectrum which is not completely healthy because um they don't see anyone in our house that has balance because I don't do it at all and he does it all the time. So in my house, it looks very different than it might be in your house. And I like how you say um, that like identifying that it is addictive and to say to your child that these, um, the technology is built to keep you coming back for reasons of advertising, for reasons of all of these reasons. And no child is too young to understand that. And by you saying, I struggle with this. This is hard for me. That's having an open dialogue, which can then invite your child to say what they're struggling with rather than having a tantrum when it's time to turn off the Minecraft or rather than secretly going to the computer in the night. So mm -hmm. I love that that you're committing to that. And, and the first step, like you say, is to acknowledge that yes, it's addictive. It's designed to be that way for you and for me and for your two-year-old who's on a, a YouTube link of um, nursery rhymes, like identifying that is, is key. So good job. There's a question here. Emily, did you want to read that one from the Q&A? Yeah, for sure. So it says, how do I balance monitoring for my 14-year-old daughter? So she expands a bit. She says, she is responsible and I recently took her off family link because she thinks she's too old for it. I'm social media illiterate and having her on TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram scares me. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what family link is, Shannon, do you know? I think that's where you, there's an app where you can see what your, um, what apps, like what your child is doing online. Oh, okay. Like it's with your, uh, I'm pretty sure like it's with your internet provider and like, I don't know hundred percent what like that um, proprietary family link is, but I think that's the concept. Is that is that right? I'm, I'm not sure myself. That, yeah, I'm going to say that that is, and I know um, I I feel you because I'm social media illiterate myself, and I I have to say, like going to these bigger picture uh, ideas of keeping that dialogue open and making sure that she knows she's 14 years old that she knows that you have confidence in her to speak up when she's uncomfortable, to speak up when, um, to come to you and let you know if something happens that makes her uncomfortable. Because 14, that's a, that's a really hard age, but it's also an age where if you have that trust and if you have that um, openness and you ask her, what is she doing on Snapchat? Or can I see some of the videos that you like? Let's do one of those, I'm, I'm not, cool at all but maybe let's do one of those TikTok dances together <laughs> to so thinking about that tip of like joining in um and continuing to just stay connected and to stay close 
And the thing is, um, all the research shows that if you block and deny access to these things, they will, they'll find a way or they'll, they'll use their friends because your friends or their friends' kids or your friends' kids or your kids' friends have Snapchat. My daughter is in grade four and there's someone in her class with Snapchat that takes pictures of her and puts them on Snapchat, which I'm horribly uncomfortable with. So I had to tell her, you can say no. Um, so, so keeping that discussion going really every day and just asking like, what's happening? Um, and, and to have faith that um, she'll come to you if something is wrong. And also maybe to do some of these uh, worksheets together or to look at some of these resources together, especially the upcoming one about um, from Calgary about um, youth mental health and social media. And I, I think that's a very topical concern right now. And if that, like, there's the safety concern, but there's also that concern around um, self-esteem and self-worth based on how many shares the, the Snapchat gets. And there is also LinkedIn, maybe I'll, uh, when, when our chat kind of, or our Q&A wraps up a bit, I'm gonna link to the resource list because there is a specific Instagram and teens tip sheet um, that came from, um, I, I'm pretty sure it came from Media Smarts, but it, um, that Instagram one is new, it's from 2021. So I think the more you may be social media illiterate, but you can still access these resources to know what's on there without having it or without overseeing her use of it. A bit related, Shannon, do you think it's important to know a lot about the specific platforms that people are using? Because I know it can be a little intimidating sometimes. There's always a new app coming out and they're always going to some new site. Is it important to know a lot about that or do you think I think it's focusing important. on, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I think it is important. And I think that's where common sense media comes into play because you can look up the app, you can see um, some of those concerns. You don't, um, you can look up, additional resources that will guide you through that. But the thing is, when you're when you're talking to your child about it or having these conversations, asking them pointed questions like, who owns the content you put on here? Our location services, and those kinds of things are all tr are universal across apps, whether it's using location, whether it's uh, owning your content, um, the privacy settings. So you can say to your 14 year old, for fun, let's just take a look and go and go through some of these settings and and see how do you feel about that? Are you comfortable with that? Okay, so this is just going to show you how to get here. So as we um, looked at before, Calgary Public Library, um, we're going to just use the if you want to find out how to get to those. Um, like digital uh, media literacy pages, you can go to connect and then to students. And this is where you can find the media literacy. And this launches right into that awesome game and learning about evaluating information and then all these other resources and then links here to the Google, the internet awesome and all of these other common sense media, all of this stuff. But for things that are specifically mentioned today in the presentation, whether you're in Calgary or in Edmonton, our catalogs are the same. Uh, they have a different um, kind of skin, but they are the same. So you can accept, no, I shouldn't say they're the same, but you can look at the same list. So if I type in here, digital citizenship, and I click list, whether I'm on Calgary's website or Edmonton's, you can click and search this. And that's when you're going to find this resource list, which is where I mentioned um, Google Be Internet Awesome. All the things I talked about today are in here. And then that Instagram one, oh, it was from Connect Safely, a parent's quick guide to Instagram. So Connect Safely also has a lot of other resource guides. Um, and you may go to one of these links and then find a lot of other stuff that's really useful. And then, of course, we talked about Media Smarts, the family tip sheets. All of these things you can link to through your websites. And, you know, Calgary has like a page that we don't have yet. We're, we're really hoping to get a digital literacy and a digital citizenship page. But in the meantime, if you're from Edmonton, by all means, like we don't have the Battle of Alberta with libraries. You can go to the Calgary Library website and you can use all of that stuff and link through there too. So 
um, we're, we're a good team and uh, it's great to see that Calgary has a lot of the same resources that we have just in different places. That's great. Thank you so much, Shannon, for joining us tonight and sharing your knowledge and your personal experience as a mom and how all of this digital citizenship stuff is affecting your family, but also, you know, the lives of kids um, every day. And we know kids are using the internet and using computers, using apps as part of school and as part of their personal lives. So being a strong dig digital citizens really is really so important. Um, so thank you very much. Thank and thanks you. to everybody for joining us tonight and for asking such great questions. Um, we have uh, regular kitchen table classroom sessions, as I mentioned. And uh, so stay tuned to both our websites for more information on that.